Coming up this week on the GCN Racing News Show, the Cotillion de Dauphiné, the men's and women's Tour de Suisse, retired pro domination at Unbound Gravel, Doise d'Or het Hageland, Doise d'Or van Westhoek, the Elstender Ronde, the return of Tom de Moulin, a big crash for Tom Pidcock, a possible Tour de France snub for Chris Froome, and the latest transfer rumours around Sam Bennett. We'd better get started. And I will start, as ever, with the biggest race from last week, which was the Cotillion du Dauphiné. Now, in the last 25 years or so, it's generally served as the key warm-up race for the Tour de France. Five of Team Sky's eight Tour wins have come from a rider that won the Dauphiné that same year. This year, however, it didn't have quite the same feel. And I think that mainly was due to the absence of Tadej Pogacar and Primoz Roglic, who have chosen different paths towards their main goal of the season. Regardless, Ineos Grenadiers will be quite content with the outcome of the race, as they did win it with Richie Porte. The Australian put in a solid time trial on stage four, kept himself out of trouble until the weekend, and then finished as the best of the GC riders on Saturday to La Plan. Mark Padun won the stage there, and I'll be speaking more about him later on. It must have been a nervous final day for Port yesterday, though. He was leading this very race back in 2017 on the final stage, only to have it all unravel after his former teammate Chris Froome put him in trouble, Jakob Fulsang taking advantage of the tussle between them and taking the overall honours. Thankfully for Port, that did not happen this time around, but it wasn't the smoothest of stages for the team. They were at a solid tempo up the Col de Jupin, with Geraint Thomas taking over from Terry Gagan Hart near the top to chase down Jack Haig. And that is where things almost went disastrously wrong. Firstly, Port found himself behind a split on the technical descent that followed, whilst Thomas was in front of it. And then just as Port had regained contact, Thomas crashed and it left Port isolated and in a group that contained all of his closest rivals in the general classification, including two riders from Astana. However, whilst things were unravelling for Ineos, Astana couldn't seem to get anything ravelled in the first place. Lutsenko was chasing down attacks when he'd have thought it would have been better to make Port do the chasing, and then things calmed down for long enough to allow Thomas to get back onto the group, at which point he obviously set a solid tempo to the finish to give Port the overall win and himself the third step of the podium. Now, I know it's very easy for us all to sit at home watching a bike race and question why people aren't attacking. And it might just have been that the rides were at their limit at that point in the stage. But it just did seem like Astana in particular could have done things differently to put pressure on Port and make sure that Thomas did not get back on. Nevertheless, Lutsenko and the team did come away with a surprise time trial stage win and second overall in the classification. Now, on to Mark Padun. He is a 24-year-old Ukrainian who's been with the Bahrain Victorious team since he turned pro back in 2018. On Saturday, he started the final climb with a GC favourites group and then followed an attack by Port with 8Ks to go. Soon after that, he attacked again and took Sepp Kuss with him. And then with just under 5Ks to go, he went again and Kuss couldn't follow. He then soloed to the stage win. And I can't remember the last time I saw a happier winner. Here's his reaction in the tent after that win. And here is his post-race interview. It was such incredible for me after such a last year where I already been thinking that maybe Sakhalin is not my sport. After the start of the, this season, it was actually really hard for me. And now it seems like something unbelievable that already it's also. First of all, thanks Jesus. And also thanks to, to my team, which believed in me. And there was also sport director. They didn't, didn't tell me to stop and wait for Jack. I helped him there. They just let me, let me go to, for, for the victory. And I'm really thankful to them for this. Great stuff. And he had even more reason to be happy the following day on stage eight, as there he got himself in the early move and then rode away from the likes of Patrick Conrad and Jonas Vinegard on the Col de Plan, eventually arriving at the finish line a minute and a half ahead of them. Now, I know his performance has raised a few eyebrows, but I've actually been waiting for him to do something big for some time albeit not this big, perhaps. He first caught my eye as a first year pro on the Tour of the Alps. He won the final stage on the circuit that was to be used at the World Championships in Austria later that season. That was in 2018. Uh, there he rode clear of the likes of Pino, Froome, Lopez and Ciccone. A couple of weeks after that, at the Hammer Climb in Limburg in 2018, he got away with Pavel Sivakov, dropped him and racked up maximum points on all the remaining climbs in what was a really dominant performance amongst some very big names. Since then, though, the results haven't been quite as spectacular as I'd expected. He had a third place on a stage of the Welter, a second place on a stage of the Giro, but things certainly seem to have come good for him over the last couple of days. 
Blimey. Uh, the other thing I noted from the Dauphiné last week was how many breakaway wins there were again, just like the Giro d'Italia before it. There were many people who thought the attackers would be disadvantaged by the new UCI rules, which prevent them resting their arms on the bars or sitting on the top tube to get aero. But that couldn't be further from the truth, really, from what we've seen. I don't remember seeing so many big stages being won from the break as had been the case over the last month. So after Brent van Moer's victory last Sunday, Lucas Postelberger managed to do the same thing the following day, leaving Colbrelli having to set up a second for the second time. Uh, things did come good for him though on day three, where he got his own win. And he was once again though the bridesmaid on stage five, with a late surprise attack from Geraint Thomas there that gave him the win, just from a very fast finishing Colbrelli. If he just had one more teammate to help him in the finales of those stages, Bahrain victorious could conceivably have come away from the race with six wins from the eight stages instead of the three that they got. Seems like they're ready for the Tour de France anyway, which is now less than three weeks away. Now I head across the border now to Switzerland for the Women's Tour de Suisse, which is back after a very long gap. Just two days this year, but the organizers have plans to take it up to five over the coming years. Now Switzerland often seems to have bad weather at this time of year, and that was certainly the case for day one of the race, which couldn't have got off to a better start for the home nation. National Swiss champion Elise Shabby got away with Lizzie Diagner with 15 k's to go, and in the sprint, against the odds, she beat the Trek Segafredo rider to the line to take the win. In terms of terrain, that was the toughest of the two days, but there was a technical circuit on stage two in Fraunfeld, a bonus seconds up for grabs at the intermediate sprint around that course. Trek Segafredo rode a fantastic race. They set Diagon up for the win at the first of those sprints, putting her just one second behind Shabby in the virtual classification. And then at the second, Diagon took two more seconds, putting her into the virtual race lead. Despite Canyon Sram and Shabby's best efforts in the finale, they couldn't overhaul a very strong Trek team who'd allowed a break up the road with nobody of any threat on GC within it. That second stage was won by Marta Bastianelli, her first win in 18 months, which is a long hiatus for a woman so used to winning and to winning big. Whilst the GC was won by Dagnan, which was her first win of the 2021 season. And it clearly meant a lot to her and her team. I love this finish line celebration. Absolutely brilliant. And thanks to the Tour de Suisse, incidentally, for allowing us to use that video. Also in Switzerland, another Tour de Suisse, the men's eight-day stage race, back after succumbing to the coronavirus last year. Things began yesterday with an 11-kilometer individual time trial, and it marked the welcome return to competition of Tom de Moulin of Jumbo Visma. And it wasn't a bad first race back for the Dutchman. He would end up finishing in 16th place ahead of the likes of Jungels, Bodnar, Ludvigsen and Van der Poel. And that despite apparently only having been back in training for a month, according to his interview with Het Newsblad last week. Not sure I believe that, but if it is indeed the case, chapeau. Uh, de Moulin will head to altitude after the Tour de Swiss as he builds towards the Olympic Games time trial. Now, it's just good to see him back on the bike, isn't it? Hopefully he'll enjoy things a little bit more after his break. Now, enjoying life yesterday was Stefan Kung of Gruparma FDJ. His Swiss rival Stefan Bissiger of EF Education Nippo had been sat in the hot seat for a long time, but Kung blitzed round the course, nailing every corner, even on the wet roads, taking four seconds off that best time with an average speed of 54.5 kilometers per hour and an average power north of 500 watts. Now, it wasn't a big surprise that he nailed those corners because he lives just one kilometer away from the circuit. A great start nonetheless for him and the home nation, just as it had been in the women's Tour de Suisse. Bissiger once again showed that he could well be the man to beat against the clock in the coming years. Kung still with the edge on his younger compatriot for the time being though. Now, the other big favorite for the stage, Rowan Dennis, could only manage 10th on the day, whilst the best of the general classification hopefuls was Julian Alaphilippe of De Quick Quickstep in fifth, whilst Richard Carapaz of the Ineos Grenadiers also pulled out a great ride. He actually beat De Moulin by a second, take his 15th place on the stage, conceding 31 seconds to Kung, but only 11 to Alaphilippe. The biggest losers from a GC perspective on the day were Mike Woods, who finished a minute and 19 seconds down, and Esteban Chavez, who lost over a minute and and a half. The race continues today and will run through to Sunday, which brings me nicely onto what's coming up on GCN Plus. 
Some of you will be able to catch that race live on GCN Plus, but I'm afraid there are a lot of territory restrictions on it, so please check if it's available where you are. That is not the case for the Tour of Belgium, though. The five-day race starts on Wednesday and is available in all GCN Plus territories, whilst Wednesday also sees the start of the Tour of Slovenia. That race will mark the return of Tadej Pogacar, uh, his first competitive outing since his win at Liège Baston Liège at the end of April. And this will be a part of his preparation leading up to the Tour de France, but I've got no doubt he would desperately want to win his home tour too. Mohoric and Tratnik are also racing, so the home fans will no doubt have plenty to get excited about. And you'll be able to watch that race live too if you're in the USA, Europe or the Asia Pacific, except for Japan, New Zealand and China. Our guest this week on the world of cycling will be EF Education Nippo's Tom Southern, who's back from the Giro d'Italia. That will be out on Wednesday afternoon. And further to that, we've got a new documentary coming out this week, which I think you'll be interested in. Stories from the Velodrome, presented by a former world champion on the track, Rob Hales. Here's a sneak peek. There's also something in being comfortable going at 60k an hour without brakes. We have a thing called a perpendicular speed. If you don't go fast enough and you, you fall off, down. you haven't reached the perpendicular you haven't speed. Reached the peak. I'm Rob Hales. Quite a while ago, I won one or two medals on velodromes around the world. Oh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you have that Thank one you. on the photo. <laughs> so why don't you come on a little journey with me to find out why I think they're so important. Velodromes themselves and the buildings that house them. That film will be available in all GCN Plus territories this week. I'm going to move on now, though, from the boards to gravel and the Unbound Gravel event over the weekend in Emporia, Kansas. Renamed from Dirty Kansas, I think Unbound Gravel is probably the biggest competitive cycling event in the USA this year, with the demise of the tours of California, Colorado and Utah. And there was certainly a lot of buzz about it online. And there's something quite nice, actually, about fishing around for information on what's going on, as opposed to having live coverage from start to finish. A whole host of former and current World Tour pros turned up this year, including Matteo Jorgensen of Movistar, fresh, in inverted commas, from the Giro d'Italia. He didn't finish due to multiple flat tyres. Uh, Quinn Simmons of Trek Segafredo ended up in hospital, getting stitches to his knee after a crash. And his teammate, Carl Reinen, ended up running for 18 miles in his socks after breaking his rim. Rather unsurprisingly, he would end up quitting the race, but not without a fight, I think it's safe to say. Four riders would end up being head and shoulders above the rest in the men's race on the day. Ted King, Pete Stettner, Lawrence Tendam and Ian Boswell, all of them former World Tour riders and Grand Tour competitors. Tendam and Boswell found themselves clear with just 10 of the 200 miles remaining, and with a sprint between the two of them. Boswell taking it convincingly in the end. King took third, Stettner fourth, and the next man, former winner Colin Strickland, was a further half an hour back. In the women's, which is run off at the same time as the men's, Lauren de Crescenzo had unfinished business. She'd crashed at the last event back in 2019, breaking her collarbone. Well, that business is finished now. She was clear of all of her competitors with around 50 miles to go, crossing the line with a time of 12 hours, 6 minutes and 49 seconds, and 15 minutes in front of the defending champion, Amity Rockwell. Emily Newsom a further 10 minutes back in third place on the day. And it was a good week for Crescenzo, who got married just six days before the race. So I guess those 200 miles are part of her honeymoon. Right, we'll bridge back to the road now with a race that combines both gravel and tarmac, Dwarz Dorhet Hageland in Belgium. In the men's, a group of seven would end up fighting it out for victory, and it would mark the first pro victory outside of the Norwegian National Championships for Uno X's Rasmus Tiller. And if what I've seen so far this season is anything to go by, it should be the first of many. Tiller's been second at Le Samin, fifth at Trobro Leon, third at the Tour de Finisterre, but crossed the line first on the uphill sprint on the cobbles on Saturday. Well, I say sprint, the way he rode to the finish line was more like a Sunday club run. It was remarkable to watch. Everybody else grimacing, ragged, out of the saddle, whilst Tiller just sat down and barely looked like he was trying. Uh, Danny Van Poppel took second on the day with Eve Lampart of De Koenig Quickstep in third. And I guess the only disappointment for Tiller was that he only got a standard sized glass of Quaramont beer on the podium. I'd have expected one of those massive glasses for the win. But I guess they must be reserved for the biggest races. In the first edition of the women's race, it was another very successful day for SD Works, who took the first two steps on the podium. Chantal Vandenbroek Black soloing to the win, 36 seconds in front of her teammate Christine Maharis, with Lorena Vibes in third for Team Sunweb. 
The year is made up for that the following day, though, winning Dwar's Door Van Westhoek in a sprint from Jolene Dora and Barbara Garishi, whilst the men's Elstender Ronda on the same day was a closely fought battle between Mark Cavendish and Tim Malier. The Belgium came out on top, but only just. For Millier, that was the sixth win of his season, putting him just one behind Sam Bennett, whilst for Cavendish, it was another very strong performance. When asked what was next, this is what he had to say. I don't know yet. Um, obviously, I've come in, I think I'm like 22 days into the season, and I've got 12 top four places, like eight or nine podiums, you know. Uh, we didn't quite expect that, I think. You know, we wanted to see how the year goes. And uh, actually, I've done better than, than I thought and the team thought, and uh, just kind of thrown things in the air a bit. Um, but, you know, we'll see. I'll see Patrick later and, uh, and see what happens in the short term and the long term, I think. The Tour de France does seem unlikely for Cavendish after what Lefebvre wrote in one of his recent newspaper columns. But we could see him back at a World Tour race soon, wouldn't it? That was his ninth podium of the year in just 24 days of racing in 2021. Moving on to other news in the cycling world, Tom Pidcock was involved in a nasty incident whilst training last week. He was hit by a car, his bike was in pieces, but thankfully Pidcock's only injury was a broken collarbone. Apparently he's already back on his bike and in good spirits if this post on Instagram is anything to go by. Now he was due to take part at the Tour de Suisse, but is now aiming to be back for the next round of the UCI Cross Country Mountain Bike World Cup, which is on the 4th of July. Now, according to rumours, he could have Sam Bennett as a teammate at the Ineos Grenadiers next season. We know the Irishman is moving on from his current team to Koenig Quickstep, but nobody's really sure where he's going. Bora Hansgoer had been touted as a potential destination, but Ineos Grenadiers have been thrown into the mix now too. And that would be an interesting move if, and it's a big if, the rumour is true, as that team is so heavily focused on stage racing, of course, so it's hard to see how a sprinter would fit in. Cavendish and Viviani have been the highest profile sprinters for that team over the years, but team sizes at the Grand Tours and other stage races have been reduced since then, so it'd be very hard to see Sam getting a spot on their Tour de France roster next year. Anyway, one transfer that has been confirmed is Lotta Kopecky to SD Works. Uh, she's been one of the standout riders this year in the women's peloton, and she'll be moving on from live racing at the end of this year. It was a surprise to see it announced so early because normally under UCI rules, you're not allowed to make these announcements before August the 1st, unless both teams agree to it, apparently. Lars Bohm, who was the team manager at live racing until a few days ago, looks to be moving on too to SD Works, which would explain why he's moved from his current position at very short notice. Meanwhile, there has been a contract extension for Ben O'Connor at AG2R. He signed a one-year deal with the French squad at the end of last year, but has impressed them enough in the first part of this year to get a new deal that will run until the end of 2024. Meanwhile, Israel Startup Nation team manager Rick Verbrugge has said that Chris Froome is not a dead cert for the upcoming Tour de France for their team. Uh, Froome was still a long way from his best shape at the Dauphiné last year, although 47th on the general classification was probably his most impressive performance so far this year. I'm sure we'll find out soon enough because, as I said earlier, we've got just under three weeks now until the start of the Tour de France, so we'll get to see the teams announcing their lineup shortly. Egan Bernal didn't have the best post Giro celebration. Uh, he picked up COVID last week. He tested positive for it last Thursday, and so now he's got to self isolate in Europe, which will postpone his planned return home to Colombia. Speaking of the Giro, Hungary will apparently play host to the Grande Partenza next year. It had been scheduled to take place last year before coronavirus struck. Joss Loudon has announced that she will make an attempt at breaking the Women's World Hour record later this year in Switzerland at the Velodrome Swiss on either the 30th of September or the 1st of October. The Drops the Coal rider apparently beat the current record distance of 48.008 kilometres in training earlier this year, uh, that mark having been set by Victoria Bussi back in 2018. Right, that is all for this week's Race and New Show. I'll see you again next Monday or tomorrow on the GCN Show or Wednesday on the World of Cycling. I shall leave you, though, with a picture of Matteo Trentin and a baby hedgehog. Goodbye.